The Crossover, bridging gaps between Jews and Christians. In these days of violent religious and ethnic conflict, the Judeo-Christian foundations of our country need to be strengthened by uniting Jews and Christians on their commonalities and with their God. The Crossover brings intriguing, dramatic testimonies and timely topics with a variety of guests discussing the Bible, fact or fiction, the Hebraic roots of Christianity, Judaism 101, the Promised Land, Creed and Deed, the Feasts of the Lord, and Never Forget, stories of Jewish and Christian martyrs and their liberators past and present. Shalom, and welcome to our show, The Crossover, Bridging Understanding Between Jews and Christians. And we have today with us the author of Doctors from Hell, Vivian Spitz, who's speaking at the Holocaust Museum, Houston. And she was a court reporter in 1946 during the Nuremberg trials. I remember interviewing a rabbi in Houston, and he was speaking how he went to Boston, speaking about the Holocaust. And one person raised their hand and said, um, I, I feel for this, but I don't know why you all have to keep bringing up the Holocaust. And he was rather flabbergasted and shocked. He didn't quite know what to say. And a Christian woman stood up and said, you know, uh, as Christians, we remember the suffering and the torturing of Jesus Christ for 2,000 years. We're still talking about it and mourning over it. And you're asking this rabbi or the Jewish people to forget six million? So here's Mitch and Vivian. Shalom. We're at the Houston Holocaust Museum and we had just heard uh, author and speaker here, Vivian Spitz, who travels extensively to share a message. My message is about uh, fighting against bigotry and hatred and never to be indifferent to evil because those trials were concerned with basic human rights and the dignity of life. Uh, the difference between good and evil and indifference to evil about uh, actually the guilt what is the guilt of the silent bystander who does not speak out against what is happening evil anywhere no matter where it is and what what Vivian is coming from is which you haven't heard yet she was the court reporter at the Nuremberg trials back in the 40s and saw firsthand uh, the evil that uh, just poured out from evil doctors that were there. And Vivian has, is now the author of Doctors uh, from Hell, the horrific account of Nazi experiments on humans. This is captured German film. The, these pictures were taken every few seconds by the Nazis, which helped to convict them every few minutes, every few hours, sometimes every few days. In 1905, a Spanish-born, Harvard-educated philosopher named George Santayana wrote a five-volume work entitled The Life of Reason. In it he stated, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And for years now, a mission of mine has been to speak about this past to which Santayana referred, especially to all who were born after 1945, the year the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials commenced. These trials, from November 1945 through April 1949 were the first international military trials in all of history with four countries, the United States, France, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union trying the leaders of one country, Germany, for crimes against humanity and calculated genocide perpetrated over a period of 12 years from 1933 when Adolf Hitler came to power until 1945 when World War II ended. These trials were concerned with three major points. Basic human rights and the dignity of life. 
the difference between good and evil, and indifference to evil. In a crime, there is always the perpetrator and the victim. Look the other way, don't get involved, remain silent, and you will always help the perpetrator and never the victim. A lucky survivor who was able to come to Nuremberg to testify to what they did to her. They held her down in the bunker. SS men held her down for six surgical procedures and they cut into her right leg, removed each time, removing a little more muscle, a little more bone, and then they healed her back up, and then they took her back again for a total of six surgical procedures. She testified that it was a year before she was uh, taken, rescued by Allied forces. And at that time, she said she could see her, the main bone in her leg, pus was oozing from her leg for almost a year. By the end of World War II, on May 8, 1945, most of the major Nazi leaders who had not already committed suicide were in the hands of US and British troops. Rather than stand them up against a wall and shoot them on the spot as they were captured, or try them immediately in summary proceedings, the United States, among the big four powers, pushed for a fair trial before an international military tribunal in which all accused would be given every opportunity to present their cases. The Palace of Justice at Nuremberg was selected because Nuremberg had been the site of the huge Nazi party rallies until he drowned so he, this doctor could get his skull opened and take those brains out. And in my book I describe this in detail where he, the doctor, sets the exact way he wanted those brains preserved. This is the phosphorus burn that I described to you where they ignited the phosphorus from the bombs which burned the skin for 55 to 68 seconds before extinguishing. One of the 112 Jews selected to complete the skeleton collection for the University of Strasbourg in Nazi-occupied France. The thing that distressed me so badly all these years is, you know, the where were we Christians? Why weren't we? remembering and commemorating uh, with all of this horror. I mean, why did we as a, an entire group just remain silent? Indifferent. And, Indifferent, and why? And why? You know, in all the years after I came back from Nuremberg, I mean, uh, no. Did you find an answer in, in your Not depths ever. of your soul for that? Not ever, unless it was just the anti-Semitism that just was running rampant uh, too frequently in my own Catholic community. And uh, that upset me terribly. I always thought that these concentration camps were just for the Jewish people. I never knew also that the priests, clergy, and all other forms of people were, were involved in these camps. And Dachau was a very brutal camp. And 
I am Catholic, and I feel that I, if I can help just get somebody, one person, no matter what religion, what race, what nationality, to understand what hate can really do to a world that's gone mad, and that we can turn it around by love. And that's, that's the way I feel way deep in my heart. Doch ob zu wenden hat uns keiner nicht gekehrt, von dir mein Gott mit einer Heilige Teure und dein Gebot. Eli, Eli, Lama, the Nazis have meticulously recorded by documentation, film, and photography almost all of their atrocities because tens of thousands of pieces of documentary evidence had been captured by the Allies, most facts presented at the trials were incapable of being denied or defended. Of 22 defendants in the major Nazi leaders trial, 19 were held accountable for their crimes individually, not collectively. 12 were sentenced to death by hanging, including Martin Bormann in S. Absentia. Ten were hanged on October 16, 1946. Now this is the only major Nazi leader that I reported. This is Grand Admiral Karl Dernitz of the German Navy and U-boat infamy. Uh, he had been sentenced in the major Nazi leader's trial to ten years in prison. He was extremely arrogant and resentful. And uh, the judge on my left, Michael uh, Masmano of Pennsylvania, who wrote, subsequently wrote a book, uh, Judge Masmano was not a uh, judge on the doctor's trial, but on another trial of the 12 subsequent trials. But he wanted to take Dernis's statement and asked me to report it for him. So he hauled him out of jail and uh, at this moment, the other two men in the picture are, you know, peeking behind Ernest, and the one at the end are interpreters. Um, we have this look on our faces at this point because Ernest has turned around, seen the camera, recognized it as a photo op, and called us all American swine. And what about today, the, uh, again, the rise of anti-Semitism? It's still here. I know it, I know it. And I think, you know, I don't know whether it will ever end. Look what we've got. We've got Iran now entering into this denial of the Holocaust and determined to, uh, I mean, I've been to Israel, corner to corner, and um, it just, uh, I worry about Israel. I worry about all of those Arab countries and especially when they have, there's a country like Iran now. Um, uh, it's, it's just to me mind-boggling the hatred that comes out of too many people against the Jews. I mean it, when I think of the great contributions that the Jews have made over centuries uh, to this world, to our professions, to every category of living. Uh, I think one of the most poignant uh, pieces of information was the fact that she talked about the survivors not having talked until about 1978. And the reason for that is because Arthur Butts, who was a, a, 
a professor from Northwestern University wrote a book and it was called The Holocaust and the subtitle was The Biggest Fraud of the 20th Century. At that time, the survivors from all over the world said, we had best begin to speak because if we don't, as Mrs. Spitz said, if we don't remember, we're going to be condemned to repeat all of this. So that's when uh, everything started happening, all kinds of books and movies and television shows. And so I think that that's a very important part of this evening. The other thing that I thought was so important when she spoke about David Irving and his case with Dr. Deborah Lipstadt. And, and tell our viewers, who is David Irving, for those who don't David know? Ir his, he's one of the main deniers of the Holocaust. And um, Deborah Lipstadt challenged him. And she won the case. They took the case to England because uh, he felt that he would get off in England because the United States is a little more lenient. Uh, it worked in the opposite for him. And he was... Um, he, uh, he has not, he, just a few days ago, as a matter of fact, uh, he, they're going to be taking him to prison. So. so let me ask you this question. In other countries do put people in jail that are deniers of the Holocaust. We don't here in America. What's your, what do you think about that? I'm not very much in favor of that because um, uh, this is such a, a passionate subject. And obviously we're not learning, because look what's happening. Bosnia, Bosnia, Kosovo, uh, Rwanda, China, all over the world. All of this is still happening. When are we going to learn? And that's why we are here. Our, our museum is built upon Houston survivors' stories. And of course, eventually, because of attrition, we won't have these wonderful people with us anymore, but this museum is going to last. It will be here to tell the story. When I was chief reporter in the United States House of Representatives in 1978, at the time of the Camp David Accords, I reported President Anwar Sadat of Egypt when he addressed the Congress. Here was a really great man and um, he knew he was going to be assassinated then, uh, and at that time, I remember, because he visited the United States, spoke before the Congress, some of our national uh, television anchors went to Egypt to find people to interview. And one of the reporters, I can't remember whether it was ABC, CBS, or who it was, went to a mosque in Cairo where there were children down on their knees in this mosque and he waited until they were through praying and then when they got up <coughs> pardon me when they got up one of the boys a 12 year old boy saw him knew he was a reporter and he went over to him and in the, the brief conversation they had, he asked this 12-year-old boy, what is the goal of Islam? And this boy spoke right up in perfect English to take over the world. I have never forgotten that. Wherever you are, kill the Jews, the Americans who are like them, and those who stand by them. They are all in one trench against the Arabs and the Muslims. Mercy, cries reservist soldier Shmuel Meir, as a Palestinian mob stones him angrily. One youth stabs him with a knife. have seen these ovens, okay? Now you may probably have not seen this. This was provided to me by the U.S. Army Signal Corps photographer for General Felix Sparks of Denver, who liberated Dachau. Okay, captured film, and you all know this. 
And this is one of those liberated. And his left arm just kind of disappears somewhere around the elbow. He did not live long after his liberation. This is the scene Eisenhower saw when he wrote his book. Now this is a Buchenwald liberation shot. And I was speaking at the University of Mississippi a few years ago when I showed this. And the director of the law school spoke right up from the back of the room and said, I know that shot. I was there. Okay. And we can move right along. These were all liberation shots. That, though, was the uh, number of acquittals of the doctors in the face of the evidence that they did present during the trial. It was a surprise. Vivian seemed to say that um, we can do a lot more in uh, spreading the message and keeping, keeping the past alive so we're not doomed to repeat it. And, um, and I wanted to know what you thought about that. What else do you think can be done since you're here at a museum teaching plenty of uh, school kids, I'm sure, that come through and, and others? Uh, what other means do you think we could do? There have been movies that have been made. Um, museums are now all over the country. Uh, I know the kids in school are learning, but what else do you think we're, we're, we're lacking on? Uh, a lot of it is um, lacking on people caring, people getting involved. When you look at what's going on in the world now, in the Sudan, for instance, people don't care because it's not happening here. Same thing happened during the Holocaust when folks saw what was uh, going on in Germany. They didn't care. They chose to be bystanders instead of getting involved. Part of the mission of the museum here is to tell the story of what happens when hatred and bigotry gets out of control. And I'm, uh, very, it's uh, very important to me to emphasize during my tours that there's not strictly a Jewish story. This is a story about humanity. It's told in the context of what happened to the Jewish people, but um, folks need to know not to be bystanders. And I always end my tours telling people that one individual can make a difference. You can make a difference. You can do things like say the joke stops here. I'm not going to listen to the ethnic joke that you're telling. Don't send me that racist And email. Vivian, what did you hear tonight that was either uh, new or uh, just made you kind of boil or just have to say something uh, after Vivian spoke? Well, she brought up the point that in the United States, Holocaust deniers have, there is no law against being a Holocaust denier in the United States, and there are laws in other countries where deniers may not speak how they feel, they may not express their opinion. But I feel that it's important. Even be arrested. Yes, correct. I feel that it's important that deniers have freedom of speech and that we should not outlaw uh, deniers' freedom of speech any more than we should outlaw other people's freedom of speech. Because, in my opinion, when they deny the Holocaust, they are putting even more focus on the Holocaust and on the events that happened. And I feel that here at the Holocaust Museum, you know, we don't tell people what to think. We show them the evidence and let them draw their own conclusions. And so I believe that with freedom of speech, even though the deniers can spread all their lies around, uh, when people see the evidence, they're not, going to, they're not going to accept those lies and it will just put more attention on the Holocaust experience itself. So I. I Judgment in the last of all 13 cases was rendered in April 1949. The 12 cases consumed 1,200 court days, and there were 184 defendants, 118 of whom received prison sentences. 24 were sentenced to death, and only 12 were executed. <coughs> Now, who were these defendants in the medical case? Karl Brandt was not only Hitler's personal physician, but he was the chief architect of the program and the machinery which turned doctors who had taken the oath of Hippocrates to the open cure, turned into doctors who became torturers and murderers. In most cases, they were distinguished German scientists, chief surgeons, and physicians at medical clinics, institutes, hospitals, 
and universities all throughout Germany. They were the doctors at the concentration camps who performed the grisly medical experiments. All very sadistic men and one woman. With what crimes were they charged? With the outright murder of political prisoners, civilians, intellectual dissidents, non-German nationals, the Jews, Catholic and Protestant clergy, and prisoners of war through medical experimentation without their consent, all in the name of scientific medical research. Those who did not die or who were not murdered suffered torture, maiming, and permanent disfigurement and disability. The victims were nameless, ordered like cattle in wholesale lots. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? In fire and flame they burned us. They mocked and shamed us. There was no one to turn to for help but thee, my God, thee and thy holy Torah. Day and night I only think of thee. I observe with reverence and awe thy commandments. Save us from danger and evil. Hear our cry, I plead to thee, help us. Help your people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Thank you for staying tuned to The Crossover, a show bridging understanding between Jews and Christians. We hope that you were able to take a nugget, one word, one sentence from this show, and that you will do something with it. Shalom. The Crossover, an award-winning program bridging gaps between Jews and Christians. For your comments, more information on today's or other Crossover programs, or if you would like to support this effort, contact us at 713-639-2888. We want to hear from you.